Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTank.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up the past 24 or so hours. Well, honestly, most of today's video is going to be NVIDIA focused, although I do have another video which is going to be up today, which is going to focus on if AMD can be competitive with the second generation of RDNA, so go ahead and check that out if you so desire. And for those asking, Hot Chips uh, Part 2 should be up either today or Saturday. I have literally just filmed all of the relevant stuff, so it's pretty much just the editing to do. But, before we get into NVIDIA, I want to just briefly mention a concept render which has been floating around the internet, and it's really taken Twitter by storm. It's from a um, print magazine, I haven't heard of this magazine to be honest, but it's uh, titled How It Works. That's not a very accurate uh, name when it comes to this render. Um... Yeah, it's basically a concept render, but um, people seem to be under this kind of impression that it might be even semi-accurate to the PlayStation 5, and I can assure you it's not. This is... it's basically a PS3 uh, motherboard. I mean, you can literally see the cell processor. Because when I first saw this, I was like... Maybe they had some inside information, or maybe they interpreted it from patents and you know you like not really focused just for a second and you're just kind of like reading it and then I was looking over some of the details and then my eye went to the um heatsink and I was like that doesn't look like any of the patents and then I happened to notice the processor which of course is the cell processor um there's a ton of stuff that I could criticize about this but again it is only a concept render I would argue that this is not really a point in existing, <laughs> to be really honest with you, um, because it's not even based upon the uh, patents that we've seen from Sony. Um, and what's kind of funny as well is that you can see that the CPU is literally pointing to a chip on the board that does not even have like a, a heatsink assembly and it's separate um, to the remaining... Uh, to the actual processor which is under the heatsink. I mean, again, there's tons of other things that you could point to, like the VRM solution, the cooling solution doesn't look right, blah, 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 blah. But I just wanted to, um, I just want to cover this because I've had so many people ask me about this. I've had like at least uh, two or three tags now on Twitter. So I figured I'll just throw it into this video and um, hopefully I will never have to touch it again. But, NVIDIA have definitely been making a ton of waves in the uh, industry of the last couple of days, for obvious reasons. And we actually have some answers um, from a Q&A session. And this, of course, as always, is uh, from Reddit. So, credit to Reddit um, for these particular answers. We actually have confirmation that uh, Ampere will support HDMI 2.1. Uh, this is with uh, 48 Gbps bandwidth. Ghost Motley on Twitter actually asked this. And yes, so Ampere supports the highest HDMI 2.1 link rate of 12 Gb slash S across uh, all four lanes. And uh, yeah. Then the SSD questions were asked. And this is, of course, for RTX IO. Um, according to Tony Tamasai... There is no SSD speed requirements, but faster SSDs obviously produce better results. Some games have minimum requirements for SSDs in the future, but again, this will be determined by the developers, not NVIDIA. Um, apparently, the compression ratios are 2 to 1, which would effectively amplify the read performance of an SSD by two times. Again, this is typical ratios, and obviously some data compresses better than others, and it's, I'm sure, going to immediately draw a ton of comparisons to the PlayStation 5 and Xbox. I would say that it's worth noting that the 
SSD technology we're looking at here is very differently. In fact, Tony continues by saying that the I.O. allows reading of data from SSDs at much higher speeds than traditional methods and allows the data to be stored and read in compressed formats by the GPU for decompression and use by the GPU, but it doesn't allow the SSD to replace the frame buffer memory, but allows the data from the SSD to get to the GPU much faster. In other words, what this essentially means is that the GPU cannot read a piece of data and then construct um, an image from that. So, for example, it can't read a, textured, uh, a texture which is on the SSD and then replace that. But what it could do is it can copy that data from the SSD much faster and it can do so obviously compressed as well as save CPU resources. This is going to be incredibly important for games in the next several years, definitely. Definitely. Um, and I suspect that uh, this is going to be a requirement, honestly, um, for games in the future, simply because of how much decompressing uh, PCIe 4 SSDs would just absolutely, just it would kill your CPU. Even if you had, let's say, 4950X in a couple of years' time, I think that other GPUs from AMD and uh, probably Intel will likely also support some type of decompression technology as well. Likely it will be a little bit different as uh, from what we have here. Tony also mentions that the I.O. and direct storage will require applications to support these features by incorporating new APIs. Microsoft is targeting a developer preview for next year, and RTX gamers will be able to take advantage of it. So it does, A, appear that you need an RTX 20 or above GPU. So if you've got like a, a GTX 1080, then obviously this is not going to function for you. And it's obviously in uh, collaboration with Microsoft. We've seen so much of direct storage recently. Obviously, Microsoft are pushing it heavily for the Xbox 2. So this is really cool. Um, I'm curious. Uh, there was also questions regarding the shader units, though... So, one thing we learned is that there's a doubling of performance from the CUDA cores and what architecture differences are there from the GPCs and is it difficult to keep the units fed. So if you have a wider design, it's harder in terms of scheduling the data across all of those different cores, but there's also other limiting factors. GPU bandwidth is obviously one of those. But it can be other things too, like caches on the GPU. Even farming uh, requests out to the GDDR6X memory of the GPU is still sometimes enough, by a considerable margin, to cause a operation to slow down slash stall. And so ideally, of course, you want a large enough caches to be able to buffer this. And... Uh, what we do understand is that there will be white papers, Tony has confirmed this, which will much more exhaustively go into these details. But I will read out what Tony is uh, stating here. One of the key design goals for the Ampere 30 SM was to achieve twice the throughput for FP32, that's full precision uh, operations. To a co that's basically but when we hear T-flops, that's what we hear. To accomplish this goal, the Ampere SM includes new data path designs for FP32 and INT32 operations. One data path in each partition consists of 16 FP32 cores capable of executing 16 FP32 operations per clock. And there's a second data path, and this consists of both FP32 CUDA cores and INT32. As a result of this new design, each Ampere SM partition is capable of executing either... 32 FP32 operations per clock, or 16 FP2 um, and 16 INT32. All four SMs uh, are combined to execute 128 FP32 operations per clock, which is double that of the FP32 rate of Turing, which was 64 FP32 or 64 INT operations. Doubling the processing also... Um, requires various other improvements as well. Uh, I won't read out all of this, but 
they also mentioned that uh, ray tracing denoising shaders are a good example of what may benefit from doubling the FP32 throughput. And doubling the math also means that they need a data path to support this. So Ampere has doubled the memory and level 1 cache performance for uh, SM. So that's 128 bytes per clock for Ampere um, versus 64 of uh, Turing. There's also considerably more memory bandwidth, so we're going from 116 gigabytes per second for the 2080 Super up to 219 gigabytes per second for the RTX 3080. But um, obviously this basic fundamental architecture of the GPU is still quite similar. So we have a GPC is the dominant high-level hardware block with all of the key uh, graphics processing units residing inside the GPC. Each GPC includes its own raster engine, which now includes two ROP partitions, each of these containing uh, eight ROP units, with a new feature um, for the uh, NVIDIA architecture. NVIDIA have also stated that PCIe 3 versus 4 probably won't make that much of a difference in the real world. Um, I'll be interested to do comparisons of that when... RTX IO is being heavily used in a couple of years' time. That would be interesting. But for now, they said it's maybe just 1% or 2% from going from PCIe uh, 3 to PCIe 4. That is obviously with a 16-link. If you're using like a PCIe 3 on a 8-link, then that might be a bit different. But it will really be down to the CPU. I'll be interested to see how Intel um, respond to this and how NVIDIA market this because obviously it seems like they're not really pushing PCIe 4 that much, which is good for Intel. Um, there was also a question regarding the performance of the 3070. Uh, someone asked if it's equal or faster than the 2080 Ti, if it's with DLSS and ray tracing workloads or traditional rasterization. Justin Walker said, we're talking about both, and uh, games only support traditional rasterization, as well as games that support RT plus DLSS. And the final question was regarding DLSS 2.1. They were asked what type of advancements we can we get for DLSS 2.1, and uh, NV Randy responded that uh, there's going to be several updates. The first is that high performance mode for 8K, so this seems like they're aiming at an RTX 3090, and it's got a 9 times scaling option. I wonder if that's because of frame buffer, or whether it's something entirely different. There's VR support, which again wasn't present previously, which was a shame. DLSS now does support VR titles, which is great. And perhaps the one that I think is going to be interesting to most people is the dynamic resolution support, where the input buffer can basically change in resolution frame to frame, whereas it's always outputting to a certain resolution. Or to put it into other words, if you were to run a game, let's say on a 37, uh, 3060, let's just use an imaginary 3060, and it's cyberpunk. Um, I say this with no inside information, by the way, on the performance of either cyberpunk or the 3060. I'm just using it as an example and you were to choose an output resolution of, mm, let's say, 4K. Well, obviously at points the scene is less demanding, so what they could do is you could upsample from a lower, from a higher resolution, let's say when it's less demanding, it could upsample from 1440p to 4K, but if it's let's say, more demanding, it could drop down in resolution, and if things got absolutely bonkers, crazy, maybe it would go down to, like, I don't know, 1080p, upsample. Again, that's just an ex that's just uh, to kind of give you an insight into what we're looking at here. And there's also an official demo of Doom Eternal, and this is being captured on an RTX 3080, I can't say a huge amount about this that isn't really just, well, obvious from the, from the uh, gameplay you're looking at here. Um, it basically stomps the 2080 Ti. Um, you're looking at 
you know, frame rates of the low hundreds, like 110, 120, something like that for the 2080 Ti. It could be a little bit higher, could be a little bit lower, but the 2080 Ti gets just absolutely dominated by the 3080, which is scoring, I mean, I'm seeing here 160, 170, hell, I think I even saw 180 FPS. Naturally, it does dip, though, when things get absolutely crazy, but, um, again, it's kind of crazy to me that this card only is costing 700 US dollars. Now, I'm not saying that's cheap, before I get comments and saying that I get it's not a cheap card still, but even so... I think it's pretty damn impressive the level of performance we're getting here. It's, you know, it really does make the previous generation look kind of obsolete. Um, at least in my opinion. Then again, if you have an RTX 2080 Ti, I don't think the card's suddenly going to turn bad. Because I'm seeing so many folks like just rush to eBay and try and shunt off their 2080 Ti or whatever. And it's kind of baffling to me. Um, like, fair enough, if you absolutely know you're going to buy, like, a 1390, fine. But, uh, in general, mm, I don't think there's, like, I don't think people should panic sell, because it's just flooding the market, and you're just going to get, like, a crappy price for your GPU. So, yeah, um, the 30... Uh, 3070 might be being outperformed by the 2080 Ti, but it also has less RAM as well. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm seeing some people selling their cards for absolutely just next to nothing. So I just wouldn't do that. I would kind of wait for the market to settle the bit, but of course, that's down to you. With all of that said, though, thank you very much for watching the video. The normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.